Good morning. My name is Lori Lewis Connerly, and I am a social worker. I am employed with the Department of Family and Protective Services. I'm one of the persons responsible for program development of our in-home services. Um, our family-based safety services is what we rec refer to it here in the state of Texas. Other parts of the U.S. just basically call it family preservation. Okay, Audrey, it's another year. <laughs> and I'm standing here again with the task of trying to provide this group with a description of who is Audrey Deckinger. Last year, I remember talking about fighting with gorillas. We here in the state of Texas just completed a legislative session. So I don't think I need to talk about gorillas anymore. As noted in the program, Audrey Deckinger has spent 30 years in three states working in the human services field. Some of that I imagine included supervision. Some of that included providing therapeutic services to foster children. Some of that was direct delivery practice. She's led initiatives, and I'm sure she's managed a few projects here and there. All of this she did while maintaining the guiding thought and focus of what is best for the child and the children she was serving. When each of us started in this work, I'm sure we made some mistakes. I, I, I know I did. Um, we didn't walk into this work with the, a perfect package of values and principles and guidance and passion or compassion for this work in the way in which we all now know this work actually dictates. But we grow, we develop, we learn, and some of us stay with it. Audrey Deckinger has stayed with it. And now she is responsible for leading over 8,000 staff as the Assistant Commissioner for Child Protective Services here in the state of Texas. I feel pretty confident standing here today and, and telling you that in my mind, Audrey is still learning, as is each of us. But I also have no doubt in my mind that she continues to hold fast to what the National Association of Social Work considers to be the primary mission of social workers, and that is to enhance human well-being and the basic human needs of all people with particular attention to those who are in poverty, those who are oppressed, and those who are most vulnerable. Audrey, to you this morning, I say thank you. Thank you for staying with it. Thank you for keeping an open mind to this work because it does get difficult, as most of you should know. And I thank you for listening and understanding what this work is all about. And I hold fast to Jeremiah 29 and 11 that says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Amen. Plans to prosper and plans to not cause harm to you, but to give you hope for the future. Audrey, I have faith. And um, I truly believe that you are and that you will continue to be covered as you continue this work. Fellow social workers, paraprofessionals, students, parents, I present to you Mrs. Audrey Deckinger.
You know, whenever Lori gets up to introduce me, I, I, you know, my notes just go out the window because she always says such, such wonderful things. Um, and so I really appreciated that, Lori. Um, you know, she said that I have 8,000 8, staff and every one of them is fabulous. Every one of the people in CPS and contracts um, is passionate about the work that they do. It, it is the best job in the world to be able to interact with um, CPS staff that are eager to learn and grow as we all do and really make a difference in their world and, and in the lives of many children and families in Texas. We didn't used to honor or include the voices of children, youth, and families, and now we do. And I'm so pleased that um, the parents who you'll be hearing from later are so willing to share their experiences to help us make this uh, a, real, a better system, a better system for everybody. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here as the Assistant Commissioner and to be speaking to you at, at, because you're all, um, we all have the same passion, we all have the same purpose. You know, in CPS our vision is children first, protected, and connected. And I think everybody in FBSS or Family Pres really gets that. That we understand we need to keep children safe. But we also know the importance, the real importance, of keeping our children and families connected to one another. And I know that that's why we do this work. Um, I hear that from my staff all the time. And I'm, I'm just so appreciative and so proud to be able to represent you. So I didn't intend to say all that, um, but Lori just brings out the best in me. What can I say? So first of all, I'd really like to thank the University of Houston downtown again, and um, Professor Alvin Salee. You're, you're just fabulous. You do a wonderful job with You do such a, a wonderful job with providing this conference, no matter where you are, no matter what the, what the situation is, no matter what the economy is, no matter what's happening, you find a way to get it done. I mean, talk about strength in the face of challenges. Doesn't he embody that? So we're so, we're so pleased that you continue to do this conference. We're very pleased and grateful that Dr. Flores supports you in this, um, that we have really found a niche where we can share our passion with each other for the work and really learn how to improve what we do, how we do it, how we learn the resources to continuing to do it. So I, I am very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased that this conference is going to be an annual one, right? <laughs> here at University of Houston downtown. I'd like to take off on the um, strength in the face of challenges and talk to you about that. Talk to you about that as it applies to CPS in Texas, how it applies to our agency, how it applies to the children and families of Texas. We've just finished a legislative session, and it was a tough one. It was a tough one because in Texas, the recession hit. I mean, it hit in about fiscal year 2010, where we had to start uh, cutting back, uh, we had to start giving back funding that really wasn't there um, because, you know, there wasn't enough money to really do all the things that the legislature had wanted us to do in the manner in which they wanted us to do it. And so we cut back. Um, and, and the staff have been wonderful about it. First, we cut back administratively because it is most important that we have caseworkers in the field to contact children and families and to do the work that is of utmost 
priority in our, in our um, business. And then we did things like cutting back on travel, um, even for this conference, while we couldn't afford to have all of the people, to send all of the people here that I wanted to send here, uh, and my staff who is presenting from state offices of uh, running up and down the highways so that, and carpooling so that we're saving lots of money doing it. Um, nevertheless, we're finding a way to get it done. And, and that's what it's about when there are challenges. Nobody wants to go through challenging times. Nobody wants to have to cut back. But it makes us stronger. And it makes us develop partnerships. And it makes us work together and to be more efficient and effective. And we're in the middle of doing that. And I think that's really good news for Texans, for the taxpayers, but more I think it's good news for the children and families of Texas that we're really finding a way to get it done in a time of limited resources. So during the past legislative session, we got a lot of work done. We got a lot of bills passed. We got a lot of good bills passed for the families of Texas. Senator Nelson, who has always been one of our wonderful advocates, passed Senate Bill 218. And that's our omnibus bill for CPS. And what it authorizes and mandates is for us to move forward with foster care redesign. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, about why that's a good thing for Texas. And in the budget process, it started out looking pretty grim. It started out looking like we would have no new adoption subsidies. We would have a 34% rate decrease for providers, residential providers, which would mean we wouldn't have very many foster care homes anymore. It started out that the relative and other designated caregiver program would be abolished and we would not be able to have kids stay with families. And through the work of our commissioner, Ann Heiligenstein, and through the work of the advocates, and through the work of the children and families, and through the work of our key legislators who really understand the importance of children and families, we were able to reverse that. The legislature really came through for us on it. We got funded for most of those things at the same levels as the previous biennium. And that was, that was huge because it meant that there were other things that were not funded, but the legislature believed that the work that we do is important enough to fund. We didn't get quite everything that we asked. We were, we're down a few hundred staff that we can't fill. So what we needed to do, again, strength in the face of challenges. What we needed to do was figure out, okay, we're gonna have a few hundred staff left. How can we not have that impact children and families? And so we did a realignment, and we're in the middle of that. And it's not easy, and it's hard on staff, and it's, sometimes it's hard on families if they have to change caseworkers. But we prioritized having direct delivery staff so that if people were flexible within the agency, we wanted to make sure that they had a job, a job that they were prepared for, and if possible, that they didn't lose income. And so we moved staff around to where we needed the staff in the positions that we needed them. And I have to tell you that the staff have been absolutely fantastic. We cut a lot of vacant positions so that we wouldn't impact the people who we already have employed, who are passionate, and who really want to continue to work. 
And then we had to make some moves. And people were wonderful. They understood the need, and they took on the challenge. And people have made it their business to do a really good work in wherever they landed in the agency. So I need to thank my staff for that, because they did a great job on that. It's a time of change for us in CPS. Not only um, did we have to have some staff change jobs and, or change locations or change supervisors, we're also changing our commissioner. Anne Heiligenstein has led us beautifully for three years. She's been wonderful with uh, legislative leadership. She's been wonderful with staff. She's been great with policy decisions and with families in Texas. And she is retiring after 30 some years with the state. We heard that, uh, we just had an announcement the other day that Howard Baldwin will be our new commissioner. Howard Baldwin also knows our agency. He worked for us um, in DP DFPS, or with our predecessor agency, actually PRS. And so he knows what Child Protective Services is about. He knows um, what APS is about, Adult Protective Services. And so we're looking forward to him coming in and ready to hit the ground running October 1st. And we're really pleased that he also has a passion for this work and is willing to step up to the plate and take on a really difficult position as, as the commissioner of this agency. But what I'm here to assure you about is all of the good work and all of the good initiatives that we've put in place, that you have helped us define, that people around the state have helped shape are going to continue. So I want to highlight just two of those initiatives that will be continuing. The first is enhanced family-centered safety decision-making, which is led by Lori Lewis Connerly at state office in conjunction with a few other people. Um, and we've had lots of, lots of uh, groups working on this from around the state. But at its core is our vision, okay? It's enhanced, family-centered, safety, decision-making. Sound like children first, protected and connected? So we're developing a practice model, policies, forms. I'm sorry, that's what we do at state office. We try to make your job easier. We know sometimes it gets overwhelming. But we're developing a practice model for all stages of service to ensure that our staff are really clear on their job throughout the life of the case, throughout the life of the time that we work with families, our vision is that the children are to be kept safe, and the way that we do that is through our work with families. That work's going to continue. And we're going to flesh that out, and we're going to need the help of our parents and the families we work with and the youth who have been through our system and all of our stakeholders and all of our staff to ensure that we do this right, we do it respectfully, and we keep kids safe in the process. The second huge initiative <laughs> that our current commissioner started is foster care redesign. This is focusing on the foster care part, the conservatorship part. When we have kids in our care, out of the home, in paid care, again, we want to make sure they're safe, but we also want to make sure that instead of shipping them halfway across the state to find a placement for them that can meet their needs, we want to make sure that we develop the capacity within the communities where the children come from so we can keep them close to home, connected 
to their families, their communities, their churches, their schools. Because what we think will happen if we can keep our kids close to home and safe is that there will be more visitation, right? Pretty important in getting kids back home. That we develop the services that both the children and families need there in the communities where the kids come from. And that we can have a faster time to reunification. And that we can increase the numbers of times that we reunify children with families. That's the whole premise behind foster care redesign. Let's keep the kids placed close to home so they can stay connected to their siblings, their families. We can stop the placement moves and we can meet their needs close to home. Those are two of the huge things going on in the agency. Um, I think it's a continuation of everything that we've been doing for a long time. It's just giving definition to it, making sure that we have our partners on board with us, working with us, and making sure that we adequately train and equip staff to do the good work that we need to do with children and families to keep kids safe and to keep them connected. Thank you all for being here. I, I'm so appreciative of the time and the effort that you are taking to be here at this conference. I hope you have a wonderful time and learn a lot and thoroughly enjoy the, um, our next panel because they're fabulous. At this time, I would like to introduce to you Deshaun Elams. Deshawn is one of the program specialists at State Office, and she's a really special lady. Um, I've gotten to know her, her over the last couple years, and she does a fabulous job of connecting with parents around the state and equipping parents to know about the CPS system, because we can be pretty daunting, right? <laughs> Um, and so she, she educates our parents and listens to them. It's a two-way street. Deshaun is really uniquely qualified to do that since she had a child in the system. She had a child with special needs and she needed to take advantage of some of the services that CPS could offer. And so she sees the CPS experience from a perspective that many of us don't get to see. So I'd like you to welcome Deshaun Elams. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Audrey. Um, as she said, I am the uh, first parent hired at the state office. I'm a parent program specialist, but I have the pleasure of coordinating the statewide parent collaboration group, which is a group of some of the parents you see here who you get to hear from. These are parents who have uh, been recipients of child welfare services, and we meet on a quarterly basis in Dallas to work on and enhance policies and procedures and various other things that the state has going on. Um, these parents also, in their own communities, have their parent support groups where they provide information about um, the process. They also provide hope, support, and encouragement to parents and families who are currently have open CPS cases. And I'm not going to stay up here long because I want you all to hear from them. Uh, they'll be moderated by Kenneth Thompson, who I like to say is my partner. He's the fatherhood specialist at the state office. And he's going to moderate the questions for the parents. But I also like to thank Alvin um, for the opportunity again to be here as the keynote speaker um, to hear from our parents. So thank you very much. <laughs> Good morning. The first thing we want to do, again, I thank you for being here. And I'll tell you, I think you're going to be for a, a, in for a treat. I think you will hear from my parents. And this is what I call some of the most resilient people that I've ever had a pleasure to meet. And so what I would like to do initially 
is to give you ladies and gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, yeah. all right, I want to reckon. I, I do fatherhood work, so therefore, you know, I got a special thing about father. So right. since he's the only father up there, I want to make sure that we take care of him. Really all right. appreciate all right. And so what we'll do, we'll start here, and I'd like for you guys just to introduce yourself and tell a little bit about you, and then we'll get into the questions for the audience. And also, uh, at the end of this, if there's enough time left, there's a mic here that we, if you have a question that you perhaps want to ask, you can come down uh, to the mic and ask the question also, all right? So we'll start on this end. Talk to that mic right there. Ah. Yes, <laughs> Hi, my name is Michelle Hansford. Um, in December of 06, I gave birth to a son who tested positive for crack cocaine, as well as I did. Um, I was homeless and out there pretty bad, um, didn't have a clue how to live or any coping skills. And uh, through the process, I was able to go to treatment and uh, 14 months later, I, I received custody of my child back. So. Good deal. Uh, my name is Lorena Brown. I'm from the East Texas area. I have six children. Um, Ten years ago, uh, I had five children. I left my home. My home caught on fire. Two of my children died. It took me 18 months. I got them back, worked the system, did what I was supposed to do. And now I have an extra kid, an extra two more kids. And we're doing fine now, so. All right. I'm, I'm Marianne Wallace. I want to stick with me. I'm Marianne Wallace. Um, I am an ex-professional crackhead. Um, I had my son in January of 2006, and we both tested positive for cocaine. Um, he, he went into kinship care, and we were reunified within seven months. Um, so here I am, five years later. CPS is killing me. <laughs> putting us all to work, and I'm just happy to be here and answer any questions. Thanks. My name is Shreya Stiggers. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. And um, in 2007, I gave birth to a young boy, a little boy, and at six weeks old, he was um, broken in, in a number of different places, his arms, his ribs, and um, it was done by someone that I loved dearly at that time. And I went through the process, and I reunified with him within a year. His first birthday, he came home. Well, Christmas, he came home for overnight visits. And um, I'm just happy to be here to share my story and to empower other parents that they can move forward. Good morning. My name is Gwendolyn Yates. And over eight years ago, we had children that were into the CPS system. Um, we have a background of substance abuse, um, and I'm truly thankful for CPS intervening in our lives at the time that they did to protect our child. Um, and because of that, we have more connections today. And we are parent representatives for, for Region 3, Dallas-Fort Worth. Good morning. I'm Dwayne Yates. As my wife mentioned, uh, parent liaison for Region 3, Dallas-Fort Worth. And uh, she pretty much told our story. Uh, I'm a recovering person, excited to be working in cooperation with CPS to help other parents and children. All right. So the first question for the panel: um, What can what can a social worker do to help the family work better with their supportive and unsupportive family members? Who wants to, Who wants to start that? Who wants to start? San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what can they do? Well, there's a number of things. Um, the new family conferences, that's where it should all begin, hearing both sides of the family, the supportive and un unsupportive, and then be able to lay out a plan on how we can all cooperate. And if we, if we can't cooperate, then you're able to see how you need to better assist the uncooperative side and empower the cooperative side. A lot of times um, with, the, with the negativity, the 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 negativity the going back and forth, you always want to be the neutral person that empowers both sides and encourages both sides to move forward past what's going on and look towards the future. Anyone else? 
and it's more than likely that you are the you are the person in the middle, okay. as she would say, the neutral. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kenneth. That's so nice. <laughs> you want to make sure that you redirect the conversation and redirect all of the the going zones of your business and let all the family know that you are there for the children. We always get we get on the side mom against dad or dad against mom or, or whoever and we forget that it's a child there or it's some children there because of all the stuff that's going on with that family. So you have to make sure that the family know, the parents know, and the family of the parents know that you're there for that kid those children so that you can always keep coming back to them. Everything you do is for them, not for yourselves. So if you as a social worker can say, okay, well, we want to just stop for a minute and let's see what's better. Is it better for the, parent, for the parents to work together or is it better for the parents to work separately? Because you're supposed to support both of them, right? And how can you do that if they're fighting against each other? So you have to pick a side. I'm going to help support this person on this level, and then I'm going to help support the other person on the other level. Any, any other? Anyone else? So let's go to the next question. The next question says, what can a social worker do to better empower and involve parents in CPS work? I think one of the things, um, and I, I just speak from experience from the last five years of working with other parents and caseworkers, I think it's really important that all of us parents are here today um, because I think one way of empowering parents is to have another parent that successfully have gone through the system. Um, so to involve, um, we have a group, parent collaboration group, to involve the parents in um, having them join these kind of meetings or have other supportive parents involved, I think is a big way to empower the parents that are going through the system at that time. Okay, anyone else? Another way of empowerment is positivity. Always speaking a positive, encouraging word to the individuals, no, regardless of why they are in the system. There's still an individual. Respect and dignity needs to be priority. Mm -hmm. the, the child's safety is, is the first priority. But secondly, when you're dealing with parents, you're, you're, we social workers usually deal with parents that are in a state of poverty or they're in a state of depression, they're in a state of low, so they need to be treated with dignity, respect, and also with positive words, encouraging them um, how to proceed. One of the things that I've learned is we, um, we are products of our thoughts, so if we think negative about ourselves, then that's what we, be, that's what we tend to do. We do negative things and we um, do them in a negative manner. And if we have people that are speaking and planting seeds of positivity, then that's, what, that's how our thoughts are being changed. And as social workers, the commitment should be to change the community. And you have a perfect opportunity to change a community by speaking positive words because now you're empowering a new individual in their community and of, of different races than your own. You're, in, you're planting positive seeds and what they began to do is change their lives into a positive manner and then plant those seeds into their children. And then you have a nation that's been affected just by your positive word. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else want to have add, add anything to it? All right, go ahead, Michelle. I think sometimes um, just to let a parent know that they have the power to get their child back, that it's not. Um, I've been working with a lot of parents who think that CPS is out to get them and that they're the enemy. And, uh, and, and being able to share experiential knowledge um, to let them know that CPS didn't just come knock on their door, that there was a reason, um, and to get them to focus on that. And to let them know that they have the power to get to see, because in my case, I thought that CPS was trying to take my child away from me. And then when I started figuring out that it was ultimately up to me um, to get my child back, you know, if I continued to do the right things, that I would get him back. You know, that's how the system was set up. And so now to just let people know that you have the power. If you work your services and you um, get through this and I'll help you, um, we can do this together, you know, and help you change your life would, would make a big difference in a person's life because I, I've been meeting with a lot of parents that think that CPS is just out to get them, that their caseworkers don't like them, uh, that, that nobody's out to help them, and that it's just all about. So I try to get them to see that, it, that they have the power to get their children back. Um, nobody else has the power to take their children away from them unless they don't work their services. 
So if you just let them know that, that they do have that power, you know, and it's ultimately up to them uh, what they want to do with, with that. Good, good. Anyone else? Involve the parents into the everyday aspect of the child's life. If you have a child that's placed out of the home or out of the family home, uh, now we have a lot of family care, so kids are going to their family members, but there are still a lot of kids that are in foster care or out, as you say, in another state or another county away from that family. If you go ahead and involve that parent all the time with what's going on, if it's nothing else but, oh, your child did, drew a picture today, then that parent obviously is going to feel obligated to try to do better themselves to try to make sure that their child is better, try to help their child get back home. Mm. Good deal. All right, the next question. How can social workers help families identify their strengths and use them to support their work in the case? Again, how can social workers help families identify their strengths and use them to support their work in the case? Sometimes the strength is just one person. Okay, talk to um, them. I come from a, a very, I don't know, supportive family, I guess. But I used to come, I used to have a family that my grandmother was the background. Uh, a lot of cultures have that family member that is their backbone. If you get to that backbone, the backbone will fix the problem. I mean, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm not being funny, I'm, I'm real serious about it. My grandmother was the type of person that if you was married and you got a divorce, it didn't matter, you still was married one time, so that wife was still included in family gatherings. And you had no say so, so if you said, no, I don't want her there, you probably got hit in the face, seriously. You know? So I mean, if you get to the backbone of the family, and most of the times it's that elderly person, that auntie or that grandmother or that mother you know, to the, to the children, the, other, the grandmother to the children who are in care, if you get to that person, then you don't have to worry about the parents because that person will make sure that not only the parent but the family comes together and does what needs to be done. My mother told me when CPS came into the hospital and said they were gonna get my kids, she told me in a very nice manner, she said, okay, you will not act a <clears throat> fool in front of my babies, and I mean that. That lady is going to take those children home with her, and you will be very obedient, and you will behave yourself. That was worse than the police coming and dragging me down the street. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. So <laughs> did I want to cry? Yes. Did I cry? No, because my mother said I needed to make it OK with my children to go with this strange <clears throat> person. And I did. So if you can get to your backbone, you might not have a problem at all. The case will solve itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to add to it? Good point. That's excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I oftentimes do the sandwich process with when I have the parents in our parent um, groups on in San Antonio. I do the sandwich process, and they present their problem, their concern, their case, mm -hmm. and you identify a positive. You lay the negative, and then you close it out with a positive. So for every negative, you always include a two positives. And, let, and that's how you identify it to them, that they do have positive aspects, they do have strengths. And you also become, you also recognize the strengths, because now you're not, you're not shooting the problem to them. You have to create a solution. You have to create a positive to go with the negative. So before you say the problem, before you say the concern and what they're doing wrong, you have to sit back and look, well, what are they doing right? I think I'm going to piggyback on that a little bit. I think it's really because I, usually when a social worker comes into a family and the kids are removed, a lot of times the families don't know what the strengths are. They, they can't see it. Um, so it is, the question is, is how can social workers help families identify it? And I think, um, you know, with, I'm sorry, Sharia. What Sharia said was um, really important is that the social worker really needs to sit back and listen, listen to everybody's story because, like I said, it's so foggy in that family that they can't, that the family don't doesn't know what the strengths are. So it is really important that the social worker will be able to point it out. So if they take time to sit and to listen. Um, and I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit on number four. I was gonna say the main thing for how can social workers best support you in the face of your challenges when you were involved with CPS 
is what, in my case, I had a wonderful <clears throat> caseworker, and what she did is she never judged me, never. You know, and I mean, like, like I said, I was an ex-professional crackhead, and I smoked up until the day that I went into labor. <coughs> my water broke, and I was still smoking crack. Mm. And not once did she look at me and look down at me. And for the first time in a long time, that was the first person that's done that in a while. So it's really important that you take those two questions and, and, and really realize that first take a second, listen to their story, and don't judge because all of us make mistakes. We're all sinners. You know, we still have to walk this path. And sometimes God puts people such as caseworkers in our life to help us keep walking. So. All right. So now, good, good point. Does anyone else have anything you want to add to question three before we Sorry. go to? That's not, no, that's no problem. That's no problem. Before we go to question four. All right. So that's question four. Uh, it says, "Is how can social workers best support you in the face of your challenges when you are involved with CPS?" I think that there always has to be a level of accountability. Uh, if the CPS worker, uh, the caseworker, possibly the judge, everybody involved expects me to complete my service plan and, and, and uh, do everything I need to do to regain custody, then I believe that I, I can do that. There's a level of hope that comes along with that. So I think the accountability, um, without touching on the next question, but the motivation and the encouragement as well, is real important. Anyone else? Because when you think about the test, go ahead, go ahead. Be available. So you're saying social workers should be available? Be available to your clients. I mean, it's, it's hard when you have your own family to tend to, but if you can make yourself more available to your clients, then they feel like they have uh, a human that they can actually go to. You're not treating them as just another case number. They're treated as a real human. Their family means something to you. So if you help them like that, then they'll help you by helping you close your case. So. Uh, so <laughs> Okay. So are, are you saying are you are you saying are you saying that what I what caseworkers and social workers should do is treat each and family Think uniquely? Think of that person that you're dealing with as somebody in your own home, as your kid, your brother, your sister. If you humanize it like that, then you won't judge them, as Marianne said, because when you when you look down upon somebody, then you know somebody gonna look down on you. I'm just saying, karma is Good. <laughs> I just wanted to add to, to what Rena said. If, if the caseworker is finding themselves somewhat overwhelmed by the caseload, that's a good time to refer them to the local parent group. Hello. Uh, Got to get that plug in. Say it again. Say it. Got to get that plug in. Say good plug. I like that. Say it again. Ms. Ace, did you have something? Yes. With, with? I feel that they need to treat the parents like case by case basis. You know, sometimes you have bad cases. Sometimes you have cases where parents telling you off, and you have sometimes you have parents that's cooperating with you. You know, a case by case basis mean I, I don't judge this one by the last one that I had. Good. You know, right. so uh, in, co in effectively communicating and letting the parents know what's next, what's going to happen next, what is when do I go to court? You need we need to know when we're supposed to go to court. We need to know when 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 uh, we're going to see our children because those things kind of boggle the parent to where I rather just drop out of society. Mm. You know, and that's the thing that we're trying to stop is from the parent dropping out of society. We need to make them a part of, a part of what's going on with their child. You know, your child is doing good over here. Maybe eventually, case by case basis, maybe the parent and the foster parent, if that's the case, may be able to meet and say, you know, where the child can see where my mom is not mad at her and she's not mad at my mom. You know, it's some challenges going on. And uh, I just always look for that support that I didn't get. You know, and I talk to parents on, uh, every month. There's parents that's going through challenges. You know, and what I hear them saying is that I can't contact my CPS worker. My caseworker is not answering my calls. You know, so that's a challenge by itself. And we get a lot of calls in, but I do agree to send them to the parent, the local parent meeting. If you don't have a local parent meeting in your area, find a successful parent that has completed the case and that don't mind talking to other parents to show them that we've done it so can you. You know, it's about the therapeutic value of one parent helping another. You know, so if you can do that, that would help. Now you're, you're, not saying, you're not saying that we should, uh, uh, are, you, are you saying that we should value 
the parents in, in this process. Are you saying that? Yes, I Definitely. am. Definitely. Yes, I, I am. just want to make sure. Definitely I, I, be seen as a, <laughs> as a person. Yes, as an individual, a human. Yes. I just, okay, I'm, I'm just, I'm with you, I'm with you. All right, the next question here says, how can social workers motivate and encourage parents who are depressed? I think, um, I was depressed during my, during my case. When my case opened, I was 18 years old and I had my son only for six weeks. 18 years old, I didn't really know what it, what it was to be a mother. So after six weeks of him being, um, at six weeks he was taken, and then the next three months I didn't see him at all. So I was depressed. It was no point in me doing services when my caseworker was telling me, you will never get your son back. When my caseworker was only speaking negative words into my life, it was, I was depressed. And what I think on how to encourage and motivate is positive words. Positivity will get you up and get you excited about, even if I didn't, even if I wasn't able to see him, just the hope that I could get him back was just enough for me to get up. And when I went from, when I went and I got my own attorney and my own attorney said, this is what you need to do and you can and we will fight mm -hmm. to get your child back, that is what pulled me out of depression. It was the positive things, it was the strengths that I had. People had to identify the strengths within me and not always was it my caseworker. It, I don't, it was never my caseworker, I would say that. It was never my caseworker. I always heard what I was not doing. I never heard what I could have done. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I tell my parents now during the parent meetings is ask your parent, ask your caseworker, so what, when you get your service plan, ask them what goals do you have for me? Where do you see me? Where do you <coughs> want me to be? That it, what level do you want me to move to that you are willing to work with me, willing to open a door to help me and we can do this as a team and that you're not against me. I felt that they were against me and honestly they were. They made it very plain and clear that they were against me and we have some caseworkers that do that. So if we're able to shift it and change it to how can we be a team and set some goals at the service plan, because the service plan is not, I'm, you're not teaming up with me to complete my services. You're dictating to me what I should do. No. A goal is different than a service plan. A goal is, okay, I need you to do this, and this is how I'm willing to help you to get there. And that is what I wish that I would have had, but I know it works because I have parents now who come in a state of depression and come into a state where they're down. And when we get, when we get together, we, <laughs> Um, create these goals, then they get to moving. They start moving with their services, they start moving with therapy, and then when you get to therapy, you're able to get more things out, and more, you're, they're able to be liberated during a time where their kids are away and they can actually work on them. I believe that the caseworkers uh, would do a lot of good if they would encourage the accomplishment uh, as, as different parts of the service plan are completed. You want to celebrate that with the parent. Uh, I also think that the caseworkers need to stay mindful that regardless of the quality of parenting that was taking place, there's going to be some intense feelings when you separate that child from the parent. You just, just automatically know that. You know what I mean? No, no matter what you think uh, the parent was doing well or wasn't doing well, acknowledge the fact that there are some intense feelings and you might need to nurture those and be sensitive in areas and again that's where the encouragement and the motivation comes in because uh, what I'm telling you is that I believe you can do this you know there was times when I was going through the process that I didn't feel like um, like they wanted me to be successful and again this is case by case I mean that's not across the board but that was the experience that I had anyone else I Go think ahead. if you First, identify if the person is depressed because of the removal of the children or was this a depression that was going on in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that most people that use drugs use them because they have some other line issue. Yes. If you identify the fact that they was depressed in the beginning, mm -hmm. if it's a young mother and her child was beaten real bad and it wasn't you know, somebody else that did it, it was her, and let's say she has three children, then each child has been abused because she was going through a depression at the very beginning, postpartum depression, and nobody identified it. So you kept working with her and giving the kid back or never taking the kid out of the household, but the kids kept getting hurt because she was depressed because she needed some other stuff going on. Once you realize that the other stuff that, that you need to work on, you fix that or you attempt to fix that and get her into therapy, 
or on on medication because some stuff we can't fix by therapy. Some stuff we need a little drugs to help us out. Legal drugs, legal drugs yeah. to help us out. <laughs> but, Once you get those together and then you do the therapy and you realize that, okay, this mom really does want to be with her kid. You know, I ask all my parents, is do you want your kid back? I mean, because right now you might be doing some stuff you really don't want to do your kid right now. You might want to go do what you got to do and then later on think about being with your child. If you ask them and you find out or if you talk with them and figure out doing that psychological eval, that that's what they need, then it makes your, your job a whole lot easier. And, so, and what I'm hearing also through this, through this conversation, that the word engagement is, is, is has some value in terms of engaging the parents, asking the parents what they feel, their thought process. How valuable is that? Very valuable. Right. It makes Without you it, you don't have respected. nothing. Without it, you have nothing. Right. Without it, you have nothing. Right. And it, it have makes nothing. you feel respected. That you're respected as a human being, but you're also respected as your child's mother or father, right. Right. regardless of what you did. Right. You're respected, and you know your, wo your role. And you also know your kit better than yes. anybody else. That, that is one thing. Mm. I mean, you a know. lot of people don't realize sometimes you see, find mm -hmm. out why the children want to go back home. Oh, my God, they're being beat all the time at home. Well, I'd rather go home and be beat every day than to go over here and have to deal with what? The unknown? That's crazy. I'd rather That's deal terrible. with this. I know how to protect myself in this aspect. I don't know how to protect myself over here. And then you might be taking me from this issue thinking that I'm just being beat down, which I might be being beat down. But then you sit me over here and now I'm not only being beat down physically, but I'm being beat down emotionally and mentally and, and, and spiritually. And sometimes that's worse than the physical. I can deal with the physical than I can, more with the physical than I can with the emotional and the mental. So if you just work with the family, like I say, just keep thinking of them as somebody in your family. It helps, it helps. Instead of saying, that's Susan, and she has all these issues, she's done all these bad things, say, hey, that's Susan. Dang, she remind me of my sister, Jane. <laughs> when you do that, then you go, mm, I would really want somebody to help Jane out. That's so good. you in turn do what? You go and you try to help Susan because you're not thinking of her as being, up. Oh, she's a horrible parent, she's done all these crazy things. You're thinking of her as, up. Oh, she's just like my sister. So I want to, in turn, go and help her, really help her. Not just help her because she's my case, I need to close this case, but really help her mm -hmm. and her family. Because by me helping her family, it is a great joy to help somebody else realize that their issue is not as great and that they can go ahead and overcome it. If you can help somebody else, you get, so, you get a high out this world. It's better than any drug. It's been an so we all need to be happy. Yeah. We need to help. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Mr. Yates, you, you mentioned the word a second ago, uh, accountability. Uh, when it comes to casework, give us a, can you expand on what you mean by that? Uh, well, in, in my situation, it was, a little, uh, it was a little different in that I, I felt as if they expected my wife to do everything. Okay. They put the ball in her court. And uh, at that time, we were both having issues with substance abuse, right? So I wasn't real confident that, you know, she was going to stay clean. I'm sure she wasn't real confident that I was going to stay clean. But had they kind of involved the father, myself, a little bit more, that would have gave us more than one opportunity. You know, um, she was referred to treatment. I wasn't. Uh, I don't think they did an, a good enough job to uh, locate my, my, my side of the family, you know, um, just, just, just little things like that. So the, the accountability would have given me a feeling of uh, an optimistic outcome. You know, I, di I, didn't, I didn't feel as if they were leading me to believe that I could accomplish this. Okay. You know, it, it seemed like a long shot. So you wanted, as the, as the father, uh, right. you wanted to have some impact or some input right. on what was going on with your child right. as well. And eventually I did, okay. but, but it took a while. Now, Mary part of that was my fault. Okay, now Marianne, I think also, uh, you know, I remember when I first met you at the uh, uh, statewide meeting, you articulated something similar with your husband also. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My husband, we've only been married two years, but we've been together 10, but <clears throat> he's a father of my child. Um, and then at that time when I was going through CPS, um, Kenneth wasn't around and fathers weren't, um, 
I guess, uh, in so many words, they, they weren't um, sought after or cared for or looked okay. after through the state. Um, but I, I'm doing it. I'm going to do it again. But the next question, it goes into the um, what helped. And the things that, that, that helped was that my caseworker inadvertently um, kind of helped my husband, knowing that there weren't any services out there. But she recommended things, sober living um, places or meetings and, and different things like that, and helped him along the way. And though it was more of a struggle for him, because I, I was more in a safer place, such as um, you know rehab, treatment. Um, and he did struggle a lot longer, but she was there to encourage him. Um, the whole time that we were involved with CPS. And I think it's really important because it's kept our family together. Mm -hmm. And here we are, you know, five years later and been together 10 years. And it's it just everything worked out perfectly that she was able to keep us together as a family. So a big thing is to, and, you know, I met Duane it, it, and I hear their story. A lot of it reminds me of, of my story. Um, but it's really important to involve, involve the whole family. And my son, at that time, you know, he never got to come home with me from the hospital. She actually went as far to ask his family to keep the kids, or to keep my kid. And, um, and it, so it was his sister, my sister-in-law today, that actually kept him and uh, my son in his home. So that was a good way to keep the family all together and involved. So. Good, good, good. Anyone else? Anyone have anything you want to add to that? All right, the next question. What helped? What would you like to, uh, let's see. What would you like to have helped your child, your children while involved in CPS? What would you like for us to do for you while, you had your, while we had your kid in care? What, help, what, what could we have done for you? Individualize me. Do not think just because mm -hmm. I have an open CPS case that I am uneducated. Do not think that because I have an open mm -hmm. CPS case that I am a drug user. Do not think that because I have an open CPS case that I am a horrible parent. Mm -hmm. Things happen. Accidents happen every day. And if they happen, then you could be on the same shoe that I'm, I'm wearing right now. What helped was the fact that I had one caseworker that humanized herself. I saw her bring her kid in the middle of the night to check on me because what? She didn't have a babysitter. She had to check on me. That's her job. And here she is at my house at 2 o'clock in the morning checking on me to make sure I'm doing what I'm doing. And you mean to tell me you have the same issues that I have? Being that I saw that, it made me want to make sure I help her by closing her case. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, it, it helps when I see that you are just as human as I am. You're not made out of stone, cut from marble. You're just as human as I am. What didn't help was having a caseworker that looked down her nose at me and told me in one instance around my family who she thought was very educated that, oh, we'll just work the system and you can get your kids back and then come to my house and tell me you'll never get those kids back ever. That right there get you beat up. Mm. You don't do that. <laughs> you don't do that. What's this? In, in my case, um, my child was a newborn, and so for me it was um, – I didn't, I wasn't really able to bond with him. Um, I don't want to cry, but um, he was gone for 14 months, so he was in foster care, and in those 14 months, we got to visit once, uh, an hour every two weeks, and sometimes the family would travel and they would take him, so I would miss um, the meeting. I wouldn't be able to, that, to see him because he'd be out of, out of state. And, um, and, and so for me, it was just, if I would have been able to bond with him more, um, because he came home at 14 months and he was just, um, it was a three week process. He came for, the, for a day and then for the night and then for the weekend and then he was home. And um, I, got, I had another baby it, during the three weeks before he came home. I, I had given birth to my second, um, well to my second child at home. And um, he was given back to me and we never had really gotten the opportunity to bond. And here I was with the newborn baby and, and had, having him to take care of also. And so I got to watch um, my child, like, really not know me. He really didn't know me, you know. And so for the last few years, it's been, you know, I feel the difference. You know, I feel like he, in the beginning, I felt like he didn't know why these people didn't want him anymore because he was just taken from them and given to me. And then there was no process of, uh, 
uh, I tried to stay in contact with the foster family and it she never contacted me again you know and so that kind of was heartbreaking to me uh, through that process if there was something in place that would you know and a lot of people don't want to stay in contact get their case closed and get away but for me to watch him go through that um, I knew that something was not right you know that, that he needed more time um, for that process um, or more time to have bonded with me during the process you know if it would have been once a week because he was because he was a newborn but I felt like it was um, the goal was unrelated adoption and so for me I felt like it was just you can see him when you see him uh, because you're not going to get him back anyway and so uh, we didn't and I did get him back after 14 months and so we didn't get to have that um, that bond and and so that's still heartbreaking so what would it have to bond it? Go ahead, no, go ahead, myself. Go ahead. Well, I, you know, I, I know that all the cases are different, and, you know, there are parents that are out there that may not deserve the time with their kids. But um, one thing that I could say is that if you see the parent pushing towards the positive and, you know, and, and actually working, you know, the services, advocate for them to spend some time with the child. Um, fortunately, like I said, my caseworker was great, but she could see that, you know, she walked through the steps with me and and, uh, and she used to come and every time she saw me, she had a notebook for every case, for every case that she had, every parent, you know, it was a notebook with your name on it. And she'd open it up and everything was in there. Everything that she needed to know about me, what I need to do was in there. Um, and if you can see that parent is going forward, then advocate for that parent to see that child. Because in a lot of cases, like Michelle and I, we never had that chance to bond with our newborn, and possibly you as well. Um, so uh, if, if you know, those times are very important. Like she said, it, it sometimes I can notice that he favors the father a little bit more sometimes. You know, and it's it's a struggle because we didn't have that bonding moment. So I think so it's really let's important. talk about this. Let's, if I could talk just a little bit about the bonding period because I think all of you say who's been away from your kids right what could we have done better as an agency to make that process smoother when you're re reuniting with your kids well with me especially when I was in treatment I went into treatment soon after I had my son but um, she made sure that the my son was able to come to the treatment center on my visiting days and that I did hold him and that he was next to my chest and to my breast area so that he could smell me. Things such as like, you know, giving him um, articles of my clothing without being washed, you know, things suggested that way. And then um, when I did get out of treatment, you know, she always called and made sure to see if, you know, if, if she could set up something that we could spend time together so that when the transition of him coming to me was a lot smoother. You know, so that finally, when I did get him back after seven months, he knew me and he recognized me and he, he, he recognized my son, so. Okay. Also, the relationship with the foster family. Mm. Like you were saying, if a lot of people don't realize that CPS does not want you to be with the foster family. Well, sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad. Sometimes it's up to that family. If they can judge whether or not it's a good thing for you to be with that foster family. My foster family was awesome. I'm actually, they're my extended family now. I mean, so it worked out wonderful for me because now I have 30 other people that are like my family members that we go visit in holidays. Whereas when we were doing the transition, they were coming back home. I was having another kid. We had to stop the transition because what well, I had a kid. So then we had to start back the transition and it went from you coming home on a weekend to you not coming home for two weeks. And then I went and advocated for myself to the judge. I need to be with my kids. I ain't like everybody else. I need my kids in my life. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, so I need my kids in my life. The judge said okay, and the foster family was the ones bringing the kids to me. So I would go to them, I would see them at church, and as they transitioned back, they would come to me, and then it wasn't a real big break because I did have a, a small baby that was with that foster family, and she knew them. She, you know, she really knew them. So I didn't want to just break her away and they never ever see each other again because then she might go through some more issues. We done been through enough. So what I did was I went on and after my case was closed, I still went to talk to the foster family because they were willing. If they're not willing, then you can't any, do anything. But if they're willing, then I made sure that she is still a part of their life so that she doesn't feel that big gaping separation anxiety hole there because these are people she's been with every day and now she's not. Mm 
-hmm. And in our case, I, I believe that the resources uh, would have helped us. The mic? I'm sorry. <laughs> I believe that the resources would have helped us a whole lot. We were new to Texas. Uh, we were staying in a hotel, so they said we had lack of housing. And that was the reason why they were removing her. Um, I also feel that it would have helped because she was removed from a home with sisters and brothers and mom and dad, that they would have placed her in another home with the same setting that had children, a mom and dad. Instead, she was placed with an individual older lady, much older lady, and some things had taken place which would never have taken place had she been with us. And when I say that, I'm talking about some bruises that, and I, when I asked CPS, well, what happened, and would you take pictures of it, they were acting like they wanted to be involved, but the real deal is they wasn't even concerned about that. So I, uh, what helped me was having the attorney that I had because I, at the time, they did not tell me that I could have a court-appointed attorney. Um, I actually was going to court by my, we were going to court by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then one day they asked us, did we have an attorney? We said no, and this guy actually gave us, or gave us a name and we got in touch with the lady. And she told us the ball was in our court, so at that time it gave us some hope that it's, just, it's, it's possible. Even though CPS was saying you would never get her, get her back, you would never get them back. I'm like, well, you know, God has the first and the last word to say in anything. What well, I believe that God gives parents, that give us parents for a reason, and that's not to abuse them, neglect them, uh, but it is to protect them, you know, which I do know today. And my child, they would say neglect. I didn't understand the difference at the time between neg neglect and abuse. I thought they were saying I abused them, but my children were beautifully uh, all together, fed well, dressed well. But I couldn't, I didn't understand it until we got more involved and we got the help that was needed and we were able to talk to the child's attorney and move her from that place to where she was with the family. And we could see the difference and the joy in her come back out, you know. And the counseling was very important. We didn't get counseling, but counseling would have helped, you know, uh, upon moving her back in the, in the home with us. Okay. It would have helped. I want to touch on um, the bonding. One of the things that would have helped bonding is know, is the caseworkers knowing and understanding the new birth stages. Um, just because you have done some things doesn't mean you don't have the opportunity to bond with your child. And, and being a newborn, they have to smell you. They have to hear you. They have to know who you are because in the end when they come home, they don't, the parent doesn't know how to parent. Parenting classes are wonderful. They are not realistic. <laughs> I knew how to be a one-hour mother for a week. <laughs> I had four hours of mothering skills a month. That was it. So when my son came home, we were commuting from home to my godparents, so I knew how to parent. I didn't know what to do when I'm at home. Four hours, okay, we can play, we can talk, and what do I do now? I didn't know. And because CPS and my workers intimidated me so much I was afraid to say I don't know what to do when I'm at home can someone help me can someone parent help me parent in home it's one thing of parenting in a classroom for an hour and 12 hour sessions that's all fan and dandy you don't have any kids to play with you don't have anything so you're sitting there taking notes and you're pulling out your notes when you're at home. You don't know what to do when they're crying. You don't know how to change the diaper. They're just coming home. You don't know any of these things, but because you're under so much pressure, so many eyes watching you, you're afraid to say, okay, this is overwhelming. I need some help. Can we transition this slowly? Can we have an overnight instead of a whole week? And I'm trying to do all these things. And now that's one of the things that, that I tell the parents is, Okay, when you, when you get to the reunification process, take it as slow as you can. I know you're excited mm -hmm. for the child to come home, but it is overwhelming when you haven't had them for a month, haven't had them for years, mm -hmm. haven't had them for a, a significant period of time. They don't know you, you don't know them. And if you haven't been able to, um, if you didn't have the tools that we have now in, in communicating during your visits, then you're, it, you're lost, and I, I, one of the things we talk about in our parenting classes on, on Thursdays is when you go to visits, how do you, what do you do during your visits? 
For me, I tell them that's the opportunity that you get to know your child. Although that CPS is looking at you, they're scrutinizing what you do and how you do during your visits, that's the opportunity that you are to spend with your child. What do you like? If you have children that speak and who are in elementary and older, what do you like? What is a favorite character? What are you doing at school? Bring your homework. Let's have dinner together. Bring in the food. Sit down at the table as a family. and. Create the structure in your one hour that you will have at home because that's what you have to take with you. So if you're coming and you're talking, laugh, hug, and kiss, and that's it, that's what's going to happen when you come home. Mm-hmm. Wow. True. True. Okay, uh, we are going to do the last question, and then we will open it up to the, uh, to the audience if you want to ask questions. The last question said, uh, and I think you've already may have covered this a few times uh, in the conversation we've had this morning. Did anyone of you ever feel like everyone was against you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if so, how did you cope and what did you do? For me, um, I grew up in, in that kind of environment um, all my life. I felt like everyone, everyone was against me. I grew up in a very uh, abusive home uh, and CPS wasn't nowhere around then, um, <laughs> back in the 70s. And uh, nobody but called, like nobody called for my help. But um, anyway, <laughs> during this case, I felt like I was looked at as a monster because that's how I seen myself. You know, okay. I had seen myself as a monster. Um, uh, for what I had done to this innocent child, you know, and so I was already beating myself up and then I felt like everybody else was beating me up too because they were agreeing with me, you know, yes, you are a monster, <laughs> you know, and so um, with that, it, it, the only way that I cope with it is through treatment and, and through learning coping skills and, and, and it was a process. So it was six months into my case and me doing everything that I was told to do, all my services, uh, I did one evaluation, it was a psychosocial, and that came back saying that uh, based on my previous, on my life history, that I would not stay sober a year. So with that, uh, the goal was changed to unrelated adoption. Um, in a little conference, everybody was saying, well, you know, they just said, you're not going to stay sober a year, so you're not going to stay sober a year. We're going to go ahead and look for unrelated adoption. Uh, we'll start that process now. And so I was just sitting there like, wow, you know, uh, I've done everything, you know, and so still the supervisor, everybody in there agreed, you know, oh, yeah, she's not going to stay sober. And uh, so uh, we, I was taken to court, and my case was uh, extended. Um, and, and so I just felt like everybody, no one was out, nobody believed in me, nobody was trying to hope for me. And through the treatment and, and getting a sponsor and working the 12 steps of recovery, the program, people always told me, you know, they don't know how big your God is. You know, they don't know how big your God is. And I always, every time I went to court and they, and everybody was against me, I remembered that, you know, no, they don't know how big my, and I never went in there angry, mad, because I knew that I had, um, I had, caused this to happen in my life. And so I just kept on believing that, that God would do for me what I could not do for myself. And that was change the hearts of these other people, you know, that I knew that if I just kept going forward and doing what I was supposed to do, that God would do what he was supposed to do. And, uh, um, and it happened, you know, um, uh, it was a judge that actually in, in my pregnancy, he exempted, had them exempt. And uh, um, he had told them that they couldn't exempt one pregnancy and then tell me I couldn't be a mother to the other child. And in that moment, I knew that uh, trusting God worked and that I was going to be a mother to my other child. And, so, Brad, how long? How long? How long? How long after my, uh, it took me 14 months. It took me uh, 12 months, um, 12, 13 months to change the, uh, for the judge to do that. And then I gave birth. And uh, well, they said that they wanted me to give birth and see if it was negative. And then on uh, delivery, they would uh, reunify me with the other child. So I delivered, and three weeks later, uh, the judge ordered that, that they uh, return my child, my other child, home. And so. Okay. All right. All right. You, you. Just um, what the last question? Did any of you ever feel angry? I will have to say I was angry. But now that I look back, um, and I was angry for three years after my case closed, and this is my fourth year, and I'm able to stand and say that I really appreciate the, um, I appreciate the process, the experience, because now I've learned the different things that 
I needed to to become a better parent, to become a woman, to become a, a business owner, a business-minded individual. When I first started this case, when I first went through my experience, I was 18, and I worked at a strip club, and everyone didn't, the, the caseworkers and everyone, the judges didn't think that that was appropriate. And I didn't understand why not. Well, what is the big deal? It's a job. I'm making money. You need the money for a daycare? Here it is. What difference does it make how I get it? But now, through that whole process, I've went, I've went from level to level. So from four years ago working at a strip club to being an executive assistant for Bear County is very different. And it was only for, through that experience that I learned different things about me and I had to leave some things through in that experience and then I'm able to grow now. So even when my caseworkers and um, the team that handle my case, they look at me now, some of them eat their words, some of them are proud of what I've done, and some of them are just unsure of what progress have I made. But I've, I've came a long way and I've had to let the anger go and see what did I benefit from this situation. All right. I, are you coming up? Are no. You, oh. What do you want me to say? No, no, no. <laughs> yes. I did feel that everyone was against me, but what I found out is that I was against myself. Amen. You know, until say I got Say that one in, more time. <laughs> I did feel that everyone was against me, even my family, but what I realized is that I was against myself. But until I got into a 12-step program and learned how to love me and realized that I really wasn't ever loving anyone else, I was hurting myself and hurting others, you know. But when I got in this 12-step process, I learned how to love myself, and I truly learned how to love my little ones when they got home, that I could really care for them and have some compassion for them. Because what I was missing, my mom raised us great. We never got taken. We were always all together, me and my, my siblings. Uh, but somewhere, I missed the boat of listening. You know, so what has been replaced, those, those uh, defective, defects of character that I had going on has been replaced by spiritual principles that I learn to live by today on a daily basis. A lot of times, a lot of times we forget that if you have older children, not only do you feel like everybody else is against you, but sometimes you feel like your own children are against you because if you have a five or six year old kid, that kid is gonna be angry because what, they're not at home. So you have to deal with, as Gwendolyn said, the aspect of not loving yourself, of being against yourself. So once you get over that, and it's hard for CPS to realize that because you don't have the same mindset, but once you start thinking of us as your family, then you have that mindset that we are just like y'all and you don't want your children to be against you just like we don't want ours to be against us. All right, and hey, we have time for maybe one question if you want to come down to the mic. Uh, anyone want to come down and, and ask? Come on down, come on down. We, we, have, we have one question, one question, all right? And we need a quick response, all right? Y'all have been very good, very good. Make it, that's right. Pressure on me, pressure on me. All right. Can I put this up a little bit? Yes, there you go, you good. All right, um, I'll finish with the question, but I do want, I, I just wanted to first applaud what you guys. Um, I've been doing CPS for about five years. Five years and then uh, CPS years, like I said before, that's like, what, 35 years in CPS years? So I've been doing it for a long time. And you know, with CPS, you kind of get complacent. You got to get comfortable with what, you do, what you're doing and whatnot. And you guys gave us a very unique perspective on what's going on. Um, I had to sit there, sit back there, and you basically put me in a, like a reality check. Um, I, like to think my, I like to think of myself as maybe the perfect CPS worker, the perfect social worker, and everything like that. But when you guys talk about what you guys did and what you guys went through and the perspective you guys had, I had to reevaluate what I'm doing. I had to reevaluate what's going on here and whatnot. And I thank you guys very much. This is awesome. State of Texas for you guys having this. You guys are awesome. Um, I would like to take this back to Arizona and take this back to the Navajo Nation. I don't know how to go about starting it, but um, Call yeah. us. Call you guys. <laughs> we'll get you hooked up. No, but this, this was extremely powerful, extremely amazing. I thank you. I applaud you guys. Thank you guys very much for giving us the perspective. Um, quick question. Denial. Um, one thing we have to deal with when we do when we go to these homes sometimes is the parents do not want to accept what's going on. Um, we try to explain them. We have the pictures. We have the evidence and everything like that. Beside, no matter what we do, they deny what's going on. How, how from your perspective, how do we deal with that? Uh, we deal with that all the time, being in the parent collaboration group with the local parent support groups. We get parents that all just, all just come to us and just say, well, 
what's the fastest way I can get CPS out of my life? Let me go ahead and just sign it over to my brother and I'll be done. I can keep continue doing what I'm doing because I'm not doing anything wrong. Um, the best way to answer that question is get a local parent group, support group together in your community. It's really important because at that time you can say, hey, you know what? That's fine, you think that way, but I've got some parents that kind of went through the same thing you're going through. Send them there and let them, hey, go over there and talk to them. Maybe they can kind of help you out and figure out what's going on because, you know, it just, it just but take it and put it on the parent support group because we're able, we deal with it all the time and, we're, and we've been through it. And I'm sure a lot of us were in denial, <laughs> you know, so um, we're, we can help you in that, that part. So get together in your communities and get these parent support groups together. Get a successful parent and have them form these groups so that you can send your, your difficult um, uh, parents that you're involved with and, and send them to them and, and we'll help you out. That's what we're here for. We're here to, to give back a little bit. So you're saying the parents can be a resource? Absolutely, of So course. if you could, please, I want to give my, uh, my panel a round of applause to the most resilient group of people on earth. Can I say one more thing? One, one second. Oh. Ooh. I just, I, I want to say one more thing. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yes, no. <laughs> um, I wasn't in here for the entire presentation, but I've heard most of you speak at various conferences. And when I hear your stories and understand the barriers that you have overcome, the challenges you have overcome, and the strengths that you have found within yourselves, I just have to tell you that you are my heroes. Aww. You're wonderful. <laughs> so with that being said. OK, I've heard someone ask, how can I get this going in my own community, this kind of parent support group? And I, I want to tell you that some of these people here are from different parts of the state. And each one of them has a CPS person who works by their side. And there's one of them in every region in the state. So what you need to do is contact Deshaun Elams or Kenneth Thompson, and they can help you find the partner in your region to help get this going in your community. All right, again, to my parents, thank you for being a partner in this thank fight. Thank you. And thank all of you for coming out and hanging out with us.